On this episode of Earth Focus, Los Angeles is known for its urban sprawl and traffic clog system of freeways, rather than its diverse array of living species. The second most populated city in America is actually a biodiverse hotspot, one of just a few in the entire world. Within the confines of this concrete jungle, species are adapting, and in some cases even thriving. Welcome to the Los Angeles Urban Wild. Southern California is one of many hotspot areas around the globe, which are areas of extraordinary biological diversity. If we just think about LA County, you know, you're going from sea level to 10,064 feet when you get up to, to Mount San Antonio. When you think about that elevational range, which is the greatest elevational range of any county in the United States, there's a diverse suite of habitats in there. And that includes, you know, habitat that might be right along the busiest freeway in the country. But it also includes places where mountain lions live. I mean, it's just this place of absolutely incredible diversity when it comes to thinking about types of habitat and types of species that are that are thriving here. Hey, I thought I told you guys to get out of here. Now go. Come on, get out of here. We have a mom and her kids all going for a nice refreshing swim all at the exact same time. There is a hidden jungle in cities like Los Angeles and a hidden savanna and hidden wetlands and other kinds of ecosystems. There's no magic line where nature stops and city begins. It's all a giant matrix. And in the most urbanized parts of Los Angeles, you can still find literally thousands of species of plants and animals. So the conventional wisdom used to be that cities are biodiversity wastelands. And we're now beginning to rethink that in two major ways. One is that actually there's a lot of biodiversity in cities, much more so than we had originally known. The other challenge is to think about how we might make this environment that was built by us in terms of buildings, in terms of the parks that we've planted, in terms of the gardens that some of us take care of on a daily basis, how could we make this habitat more hospitable to non-human species? Understanding how species are adapting to, to urban areas is an area of research that, that people are really just starting to um, get serious about studying. Things like coyotes and, and mountain lions and bobcats, you know, species that we may not always think about as being city dwellers, but in fact, with a little bit of research, you realize are actually part of the story of, of a big city like Los Angeles. The reason that they now inhabit what we consider to be our spaces is that the city has expanded out into their habitat. But coyotes are also one of those species that do make use of human settlements in often quite ingenious ways, in that they obviously have learned when to cross streets and when not to cross them. 
It turns out that coyotes are very smart about actually observing the change of traffic lights. So this is the back side of the park here. There are almost no limits to coyotes' ability to adapt to the urban environment. Because South Central LA is probably synonymous with the most inner city neighborhoods in the world. Finding coyotes here is just, just amazing to me and exciting every time I'm able to collect some more scat. Here in, in South LA wetlands, um, there's proof that coyotes use this area. Um, because I'm finding coyotes scat inside um, these fences. Coyotes are a species that most people know live in the LA area, but people think that they live in the mountains, uh, mountainous areas or Griffith Park where there's more open space, uh, but really don't really think of them as animals that are able to adapt to this type of landscape. back to the ranger station. Yeah, so we're in Griffith Park, and here is one right here. This park is surrounded by freeway, by urbanization, by some major barriers for wildlife. So we just saw two, maybe three coyotes within this picnic area. So they know that this resource is here on a regular basis. Coyotes are doing pretty well in this urban landscape thanks to their adaptability. Um, but the mountain lions are another story. They're, they really need some help if they're going to have a population here for multiple generations to come. I use camera traps, which are motion-activated cameras um, that have a sensor in front that's triggered by motion or heat that allows me to document wildlife that is using a particular area. And each photo or each image is time and date stamped to tell me activity levels of certain species. Oh, there he is, walking right past on the same trail. Yeah, he's looking healthy. He's walking really well, which is great to see. P22 kind of adapted to Griffith Park. And when I say kind of adapted, I mean that he has retained the same behavior of his rural counterparts in Patagonia and in the Western Santa Monica's. But at its core, his story is about survival. And a lot of people can relate to a story where it's about an individual um, basically facing some very uh, seemingly insurmountable odds and defeating them. His ability to get into this park, cross through freeways that have killed multiple mountain lions before, and live in a space that is an unprecedented um, amount of space for a mountain lion to survive in. Usually a male mountain lion needs about 200 square miles of space to itself, and Griffith Park only offers nine square miles. We know that the level of urbanization that we are bringing to this landscape is causing immense fragmentation. You know, what are the impacts of freeways like the 405 and the 101 um, and the 5 gonna do in terms of allowing these populations to continue to have gene flow so that we're not facing massive issues of inbreeding? 
I'm sure there's a lot of times where he's a lot closer than we think, um, but but he's he's doing what Pumas do best, which is uh, avoiding people at all costs. And that's why they've been around LA for so long. They, that's why they've been able to survive in this area surrounded by people. He's not now, because he lives in Griffith Park, going after people's chihuahuas and pet cats, or kind of gotten used to outdoor lighting. He's retaining his behavior as far as eating deer, but he's somehow, and we don't know how he's doing this, He's finding enough prey, and he's being he's able to avoid people, um, even though there's so much more activity in his habitat than other mountain lion habitat. P22 has gone through a lot of misadventures because he's a celebrity. He's been able to kind of survive a lot of these circumstances. One of those incidences was him getting stuck under a house and wildlife officers shooting him with bean bag rounds and uh, tennis ball guns. He kept his cool to the point where he waited for those people to tire themselves out before he left. And he left without anybody seeing him. And that's him being able to kind of use those natural skills of being elusive to keep his distance um, and stay safe. Even the most adaptable species uh, out here, arguably the coyote or the raccoon, have trouble in this landscape because of roads and of a lot of other urban dangers. And the reality is that decisions that we make today are gonna be all the difference as to whether those mountain lions are in the LA area 100 years from now. We have been overall, over the last 150 years, been very successful at displacing, especially a lot of the animals out of the city that were to some degree harmful to human health and well-being. But we're now also realizing that in some sense we have overdone that. I believe it's our responsibility to facilitate um, their coexistence with us. And for mountain lions and wide-ranging species that also include deer, uh, we need to allow for safe passage across these very formidable barriers that we've created. What's being proposed along the 101 freeway in Agoura Hills is to build a crossing, a wildlife crossing. This is not a new concept. A lot of other countries have already built these wildlife crossings. What these are, are, are not just bridges, but they're bridges that are vegetated, that have nice restoration that's done um, leading up to these crossing points and fencing that funnel these animals. The cost is comparative. So it's $50 million that we're, we will invest in mountain lion habitat that we won't invest in something else. So I think there needs to be democratic decision-making and extensive consultation about whether we want to do this and, and who will raise the money for this, who will pay for this, of what do we owe mountain lions, what do we owe to other species of plants and animals. Man-made structures act as barriers for lots of species in urban areas, but some aspects of our infrastructure actually allow non-native species to thrive. The big moment for thinking about water in Los Angeles is 1913. But once you have permanent water on the landscape, lots of non-native species, if they get introduced, can now make it. And so what's happened is that non-native species that get introduced to Southern California that are maybe from a more tropical place, now can make it here because there's much more water. And one of the ways that a lot of these species are coming in is actually via the nursery plant trade. Things like brown anoles and green anoles and various species of geckos and now a thing called the coqui frog. Coqui, coqui, coqui. And it might do this all night long. So if you live in a neighborhood with a coqui frog, you might find it incredibly aggravating. 
So the Coquille frog was introduced to Hawaii in the 1980s. Once they get established in Hawaii, they start coming into California on nursery plants. And so now we have them established at two nurseries here in Southern California. We currently have 15 people out helping us search for these coquille frogs, and that includes biologists with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as biologists with the Natural History Museum. But there's these real implications of these coquille frogs sort of showing up and having these and having these impacts, and it's just all because they're doing what a lot of other species are doing, which is hitchhiking rides in the nursery plant trade. And as a biologist, my interest is understanding how species are dealing with urbanization, whether those are native species that are trying to um, adapt to these urban settings, or whether these are non-native species that have been introduced as a result of human activity and are also trying to find a way to make it here in the Los Angeles area. And we were here specifically to look for slender salamanders. Can you give me a hand grabbing these? And we were able to find seven slender salamanders. And on top of that, we found two other native species, a western fence lizard and a southern alligator lizard. You got a Bromity blind snake? No way. They're super squirmy. Yeah, so we got a, br a Bromity blind snake here. Yeah, we don't have any, I don't have any reports of Brahmini blind snakes right around here. With those slender salamanders, we were able to uh, use some swabs to swab their skin. And those swabs will then be, uh, the DNA in those swabs will be sequenced. In addition to that, we were able to take some measurements, some length measurements and some weight measurements. Yeah, 0.5 grams. I certainly was hopeful that we would get one species today. I never imagined that we would get four species. In urban places, you have these huge matrices of, of private property. It's just a giant jigsaw puzzle of private property. And so as a biologist, every 10 steps, I'm on a new piece of private property. What we found is that the best way to do biodiversity research in urban areas is to enlist the help of literally thousands of people. Greg and Emily Hahn and other community scientists that have participated in our programs are what allow us to do urban biodiversity research. I was just, I don't know, I staring off in the distance while <laughs> scrubbing dishes and, and I saw this uh, little bit of bright blue that did not look like anything you would see in your backyard. Our claim to fame is we discovered a population of previously undiscovered snails in Los Angeles. So we immediately you know, started looking for more snails and um, found a bunch of other really tiny little snails. He put a picture of the snails on Instagram, and once he did that, uh, we got a notification that scientists um, and other snail enthusiasts um, were very excited about this uh, snail find. It looks great back here, Emily. Oh, thanks. And I contacted Gregory to say, can I come out and get it? Because we don't have any of those specimens in the collection. Yep, that's Zerotrika there. And who's this little guy? That, is that a Cocosillo? Barbara, Barbara? Yeah, yeah, really teeny tiny yep. one. That's a juvenile. So in February 1st of 2016, I came out here, the Hans invited me, and we just did a little exploration of their backyard and collected Xerotrica conspicata, so the species we're talking about, but then also this other species called Coclicella barbara, which also is a first record for Los Angeles County. And then now, almost two years later, I'm back assessing, are those species still here? And they are. And we literally are collaborators. Like, we have papers together with all of our names on it. So those are things that that, that collaboration makes this specimen and citizen science and, you know, standing in this backyard a really meaningful thing. This one's gonna go right there. We have uh, the specimens that you see behind me and other specimens all throughout this institution, over 35 million specimen and specimens and historical collection objects. And those can basically be a time machine so that we can understand where species were found in the past. When we think about the greatest threats to biodiversity that our planet is currently facing, you know, we think about things like climate change. Um, and the reality is that one of the biggest threats is actually urbanization. So we now know that uh, as of 2009, 50% uh, of the human population is now living in urban areas. And so suddenly it becomes a huge imperative 
um, on people to understand how we can make urban areas more welcoming to sort of native and, and desired species. And what better place to do that than Los Angeles? Esperanza is located in one of the highest density neighborhoods of downtown Los Angeles. I'm the principal of Esperanza Elementary School, just east of the skyscrapers of downtown in the Westlake neighborhood, downtown Los Angeles. Can you write the name and post it under the correct bird? How strange, morning dove, European starling, bluebird, blackbird, red tailed hawk, American crow, hooded oreo, um, gray egret, gray blue heron, and a mockingbird. The students love this. They love charging in here and really getting to know at a very deep, profound level uh, what's showing up in our habitat. We observe, we record, we analyze, we share. All of these are important skills for our students. So at the very bottom, do you see the live spider in there? Yeah. I'm surrounded by deer weed, native sages, and cilia, uh, but if you go back to 2014, I would have been standing on asphalt. Peel back that asphalt. Uh, allow the dirt to be there, to plant native plants, and create a living laboratory for students to really explore. My name is Ramona Gamino. I like to about it because we come and explore nature and in the garden. What I see in the garden is um, hummingbirds, mockingbirds, and flowers. My name is Jimena Lopez. We're, we're trying to illust illustrate um, poppies and deer grass. The, the California poppy is um, a flower native to California. It was a beautiful thing to have a burrowing owl be discovered by a fourth grade student uh, two winters ago. And even more incredible was that this little owl stayed with us. And so um, I sometimes think of this as a zoo without cages. I think of my students who live in those buildings right across the street. They wake up in a concrete building. They go down concrete stairs. There's a little patch of concrete maybe to bounce a ball. They walk across a concrete so sidewalk, an asphalt street, another concrete sidewalk, and they come onto a campus which is largely asphalt. Then they go home and they do it again. They need this connection to nature, like every human being. Now they have access to nature right here on their campus. I like to call it multi-species justice, so it's thinking about what is it right to do by people, how do we make this a more just, a more fair space for the different groups of people who inhabit the city, but how do we also make it a habitable place for the non-human species that are already here? There has been this general idea out there that if you want to see nature, you need to go to Yellowstone or Yosemite, and the reality is that that's not true. And everybody should know that that's not true because they just have to start looking around and they can see the incredible diversity of species that are around them at all times. You don't need to travel anywhere to see nature. You just need to start observing. Earth Focus is made possible in part by the Orange County Community Foundation and the Farview Foundation.